stupid pencil, always breaking. <laughs> Isn't that like our human nature? To get in the wrong mindset and sometimes focus on the wrong things. Sometimes we lose sight of the big picture or sometimes we just focus on everything that's wrong. And it's those times that it seems like our list of problems is long and our list of blessings is short. And we miss out on all that God has for us. If you need some help this week, you know, remembering and being thankful for everything that God has given you, I invite you to join me to, as together we unlock biblical wisdom for life with a Thanksgiving message titled, Remembering the Harvest. Hi, I'm Pastor Willie Vaughn with Out of the Box Ministries, and I wanna wish you a happy and blessed Thanksgiving. Thank you for joining me today as together we prepare our hearts to truly give thanks to God. Before we get started, I wanna give a shout out to John. John, thank you for your encouragement, and we're praying for you and your family on this new ministry adventure you're on. Now, Psalm 103 verse two says, praise the Lord and forget not all of his benefits. And sometimes we can kind of get narrow-minded in our idea of even what God has given us. We can kind of look at our salvation and say, okay, I know Jesus forgave me. I know that I'm going to heaven. But we put God in that Sunday morning box and we're like, yeah, that's great. <clears throat> but it doesn't really butter my bread and put gas in the tank right now. We can get so caught up in, in thinking about <clears throat> the spiritual blessings that we don't realize that he's given us all the blessings, all these benefits. Now we have this wonderful holiday in America called Thanksgiving. It's a day that started out and the pilgrims, uh, people who were, came here to worship with freedom of worship. And they went through a brutal winter and finally began to prosper in this new land, gave thanks to God for their blessings. Later in the history and tradition, presidents would set aside a day of the year as a day of prayer and thanksgiving. But for a lot of us, it has really kind of just become the day where we enjoy turkey, football, and family before we get rushing out to do all our shopping and prepare for the most wonderful or the most busiest time of the year. But there's so much tradition and, and things to be thankful for when we think of ourselves as Christians. Throughout history, Thanksgiving, especially been in an autumn, a fall season holiday, has been used a lot of time to give thanks for a plentiful and bountiful harvest. Of course, many of us, we don't get our livelihood from farming anymore and our lives don't revolve around a seasonal bringing in of the crops. And yet, I think each of us has a harvest that we can celebrate in Christ Jesus. Several, in fact, there are several ways in which God gives us a plentiful harvest. And those are the things I wanna talk about today with you as we encourage our hearts to give thanks to God for all of his benefits. Because God has blessed us with physical blessings, with a physical harvest. He's given us an eternal harvest in our hearts and souls. And he's given us an eternal harvest. That salvation, that we can know him forever. So let's start off with that first, that physical harvest. Philippians 4.19 says, My God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glorious and Jesus Christ. Do you hear that promise? Paul writes, my God will meet all your needs. Not just your spiritual, but all of them. Your physical needs as well. And I think we're blessed when we start to realize that God provides for all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Jesus Christ. But how do we, how does that, how do we experience that? How do we know that? And how do we really appreciate that? Well, I think Jesus gave us a hint, gave us a clue when he was teaching and preaching one of his parables found in Mark chapter four, verse 26 through 29. This is what it says. He also said, that's Jesus. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. There's a lot of people who kind of fall for that myth that we have of being the self-made man. 
It reminds me of that joke about the scientist who went to God and said, we don't need you anymore. We figured out how to create life without you, how to create life on our own. And God just looks at him and says, really, why don't you show me? So the scientists, they reach down, they get a handful of dirt and God says, hold on, hold on. Start with your own dirt. You see, when we realize that God has given us everything, we realize that he has given us our very lives. Psalm 139 says, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I am praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. The work of your hands is wonderful. I know that full well. And God's work, God's handiwork is wonderful. And he created us and built, put us together in our mother's womb. Before the foundations of the earth, he built us and designed us. He's given us the arms and the legs and our brain and all our bodies and everything that we have. He's given us the ability to use the skills that we have. And even like Jesus was saying, the soil produces that food, even though the farmer doesn't know how, day and night. All by itself, the soil produces grain. For the first several years of your life, it wasn't that you worked hard. It wasn't that you had it all together. It wasn't that you figured it all out. But you were growing, and God gave you the, your skills and your body, your mind, your personality. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, Remember the Lord your God because He gives you the ability to create wealth. Whatever you do for income, whatever you do for work, it's a God-given ability. And God has also written the story of your life. Psalm 139 continues in verse 16. It says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before there was one. You didn't have any choice in where you were born, who your parents were, what era you were born, and what time frame, what con your country of origin, or the opportunities you've had for education and training. Those were all gifts, the seed that God has scattered in your life to bring you to where you are today. And all that you have and all that you're able to do and accomplish is a harvest of those seeds, of those gifts that God has given you. And God has given you so many things. He's given you the ability to create wealth. He's given you your unique personality. He's given you your family, your friends, the people who God brought into your life, who encouraged you, who, who built you up. Maybe who even challenged you as iron sharpens iron, it says. One man sharpens another. And all these things, God works those things together. Now, not everything in your life has been good, but Romans tells us also that God can even work all things together for the good of those who love Him. He takes even your challenges, even the things that got messed up in your life and uses them for your good. Very often, it's sometimes out of our greatest pain and our biggest, deepest hurts that we can have our greatest accomplishments. It's a pain that we endure that leads us into professions that we have. People who were hurt as young people end up going into professions to try to overcome that. People who want to protect others, it's because they felt vulnerable at a young age. God uses even our hurts, our pains, and our challenges to help us to be able to provide for our needs and to bring us to where we are. And when we start to realize that all of our physical needs and all of the, the things that we have are a gift from God, it gets us in the right mindset. Now we have Thanksgiving and we can say, yeah, I think, thank God for that, but I think God wants more than just for us to have one day where we eat turkey and say, hey, thank you, God. God wants us to live a life of generosity. He tells us all throughout the Bible to give to those who are in need. In fact, in 1 John 3, 17, it says, if you have the the goods of this world and you see your brother who is in need and don't help them, the love of God does not abide in you. And so it's often when we have and we realize that God has given us so much and we look for others around us who have less, who are lacking, that we can pour out to them. And when we give to those in need, it's like we're opening up the door for God to show us how blessed we really are, how much we really have. Sometimes we get so caught up in our own mindset about thinking about all the things we don't have, but when we notice another person in need and we realize we have something to give, it fills our hearts with gratitude for how much we really do have when we have that contrast and that perspective. But God also tells us to trust Him and to give thanks for all the blessings He's given us because He wants us not only to be generous but to experience rest. Psalm 127 2 says, In vain you get up early and work late, toiling for food to eat. Don't you know that God gives rest to those he loves? 
If you've ever talked to someone who's been around for a while, they'll tell you that working hard and worrying doesn't really add value to your life, whether it's financial or otherwise. Because eventually you get to the point where no matter how hard you work, it seems all the money you make just goes into a purse with holes in it and it just falls right back out within a balance. Now, yes, we're to work hard, but that's not all life is about. So when we start to thank God for all of his benefits and realize that he provides for all of our needs and our physical needs, our financial needs, we're able to give more generously. We're able to have a heart full of gratitude. We're able to rest. And when we rest, I think that's when we take the blessings of God and we start to realize and experience an even greater and deeper harvest. It's that internal harvest, the harvest of the soul. Third John 1, 2 says, Beloved, I pray that it all may go well with you and you may enjoy good health even as your soul prospers. See, God wants you to have your physical needs met, but he also wants you to have a prosperous soul. He wants you to have a good harvest in your heart and your soul, in your inner being. I think we all know what it's like to have a good harvest in our soul. We've all experienced love and joy and peace and just that sense of wholeness in our hearts. But I think we've also experienced and seen in life what it's like and what kind of harvest comes about from a broken heart, a broken soul. God's word talks about the harvest of a broken soul and of a godly soul in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 23. Maybe you know it, the fruit of the Spirit. And this is what it says. And I'm going to read to you from the New Willie translation, my own personal paraphrase. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your human nature. For the Human nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God desires what is contrary to our human nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you don't have to live by a list of rules. The acts of the human nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. There's a word we don't use often. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, of course, the critical Christian can get to wagging their tongue and wagging their finger at those big three. You know, the orgies and the sexual immorality and the drunkenness and the witchcraft and the idolatry. But I think we all struggle sometimes with that hatred, that discord, that envy and jealousy and fits of rage. We tend to lose our temper. And we can even add to that, that unforgiveness, that self-centeredness, anxiety, depression, anger, fear, worry. The things that we all struggle with, those are the things in our heart and our spirit that we all struggle with on various levels. But I don't think God is giving us this passage just so that we know, hey, say, hey, there's a difference. But he's saying there's an answer to it. And he's saying this is what you can harvest from a life with God. And sometimes we can get caught up. And when we start to see in our lives that we're harvesting this anger and this anxiety and this worry and these fits of rage and we're losing our temper, maybe to look back and say, what have we been planting? What have we been sowing that's bringing this about? What have we been engaging in in the past weeks or months of our lives? You know, binge watching Netflix can be relaxing in the moment, but it won't over time build up that kind of harvest in our souls that we all want because we all want more of that love, joy, and peace. And sometimes we need to invest in our hearts, in our souls, in the things that are going to bring about a harvest. In Galatians, it says, God will not be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. What you've planted, what you put into your heart is what you're going to get out of it. A couple weeks ago, I did a message along these same lines, garbage in, garbage out, testifying that what we put into our hearts, what we put into our minds is what we're going to get out of it. 
Many of us, we're eating the cake that we baked. If we don't like it, we can change the recipe. We can do something different. Maybe it's something practical. Now, I'm not saying you have to live your life in church, but there's some things we can do. Maybe get up five minutes earlier and spend a few minutes in prayer and quiet time with God. Take a few minutes on your lunch break and just read a few scriptures. You don't have to carry around a big bulky Bible. We have them on our phones now. Maybe change what you listen to on the way to work. News can bring you down, but listen to a sermon or a podcast that encourage you in God. Or maybe just turn everything off and listen to the voice of God. Hey, instead of falling asleep to the TV, why not read the Bible before bed? Fill your soul up with messages like this that'll bring about a wonderful harvest that you can have in your life. Or maybe you're saying, you know, my life's not bad, I can't complain. It's so-so, but is it contentment or is it full of peace and joy? Because God wants you to experience an abundant harvest in your soul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, when a man, a man who sows or plants sparingly will reap sparingly, but one who sows generously will reap generously. Maybe it's just giving a little bit more time to the things of God in your life. So you can reap more patience, more peace, more love, more joy. But even in that, God wants us to experience a phys or have our physical needs met to experience a physical harvest. He wants us to enjoy a bountiful and wonderful harvest in our soul and our spirit, an internal harvest. But even if we have all those things, we're missing out if it's just that first chapter because God also wants us to experience an eternal harvest. In fact, Jesus said in Mark 8, he says, what does it benefit a man? What, is it, what profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul for eternity? God wants you to experience an eternal harvest. Most of us know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. It's a story that we, many of us are familiar with, but one, a truth that's worth repeating. Romans 3.23 says, we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And we know that, that on our own, we're not good or holy or perfect. And the Bible takes it a step further in Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. You know, the, the way we've lived, what we've earned, is separation from God. The way we've lived our lives often in the sinfulness and, and turning from God and living in our own ways, we've earned to be separated from God in this life and the next. But God in His awesome grace has given us eternal life in Christ Jesus. And it's not even that we had to get things all figured out and clean ourselves up first. But while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While you and I, before we'd even started to come to God, while we were destined to live a life of sin, running away from God, it says in Romans 5.8, that God showed his love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus spoke about his life and his sacrifice for us. In John 12.24, it says, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it is just a kernel of wheat, but if it dies, it'll bring forth a harvest. And see, Jesus was willing to let his life be that seed, to be planted in the soil so that we might reap a harvest of eternal life, a harvest of His goodness. And like a seed, He was planted in the tomb in the soil and it didn't sprout right away. But on the third day, the tomb opened and resurrection life poured forth. And there's this amazing thing called salvation. It takes that seed that seed in that soil, that seed of Jesus' sacrifice, His perfect and holy sacrifice, but also the testimony of many witnesses. And because He appeared to 500 people later on. And it's those people who told the story, who shared with someone else, that the message went throughout the world. And the work of the Holy Spirit, the bringing that weather and the rain at the right time that opened up your eyes and mine, our ears to hear this message, that we might receive this eternal blessing. And so we thank God for His eternal harvest, but we also get to be a part of His eternal harvest. 
Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38. And it says, Jesus went throughout the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We who have tasted the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who have experienced it, have the privilege and the responsibility to be a part of that harvest. That we get to be the laborers sent out into the harvest. Now your job and my job may be different in that, but the goal is the same. In, the, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, it says, one who plants and one who waters have the same goal in mind. And they both get rewarded for their work because we are co-laborers together in this. Together in God's mission to bring about a harvest. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer for those who ask you of the hope that you have in you. And do so with gentleness and respect. In 1 Timothy 4.5, it says, fulfill the duties of your ministry with all diligence. Now we know these scriptures aren't just written to the pastors and priests. Just like salvation isn't just a gift for those who are holy, it's for all of us. Now you may be called to just give to a ministry or be actively working in ministry, but all of us have a part to play, to be giving an answer to others, to support those who minister. And we get to be part of his harvest, to get not only to be benefactors of this eternal harvest, this eternal life, but also of a fruit of righteousness when we see him and get the rewards in heaven, when we see him face to face. But also, I hope that if you haven't yet received this, that you would consider being a, receiving this eternal harvest. And I want to share with you a little bit of what Paul says about this harvest for eternity, where he says in 1 Corinthians 15, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I have preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this good news you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise what you believe is in vain. For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And this message has gone throughout the world and even goes to you right now. And you have been given free will to hear and see and taste this message if you're willing to reach out and harvest it for yourself. It's almost as easy as picking an ear of corn. And if you're ready to get that harvest, that harvest of eternal life, all it takes is simply confessing that you know you've sinned and you've done evil in God's sight, that you're not good enough, but that you believe the true story that God sent His one and only Son to die for you and you're willing to receive Him, His forgiveness, to learn about Him and to live for Him. If that's your ca the case, that's the case of your heart right now, I invite you to pray with me. Just say these words after me. Jesus, I do believe that I'm a sinner and I know I've done wrong. I know I need your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins, that you were raised to life on the third day. I wanna live for you. Teach me, show me your ways. I make you my Lord, my Savior, my God and my King. The Bible says if you've prayed that prayer with all sincerity, that you've been born again, become a new creation. And we'd love to help you, encourage you, so that you can receive all the blessings of the bountiful harvest that God wants to do in your life. So let us know by texting SAVED to 973-755-1637. As you celebrate and enjoy the festivities of this Thanksgiving week, and you prepare your hearts, remember to give thanks to God for all of His benefits. He provided for all of our physical needs. He gives us a harvest in our soul that is abounding the more we pursue Him, and He's given us eternal life in His Son, Jesus. And remember 
that for the Christian, Thanksgiving is not just one day, but it's every day of our lives. Psalm 100 verse four says we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. That when we give him thanks with a gratitude in our hearts, we open up the door for him to reveal his glory in our lives. Thank you for joining me. I pray this has helped you just revive a, a sense of gratitude in your hearts. Until next time, have a wonderfully blessed Thanksgiving and remember, Jesus loves you and so do I.